So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Gary Roberts, our wonderful speaker today. Um, he is a naturalist. He is a registered Maine guide. I have heard this gentleman speak several times. He is a consummate presenter. You're going to love what he knows and shares, <laughs> and you're in for a delight. So um, welcome, and thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. And today we're going to be talking about birds primarily, but I wanted to focus a little bit more on spring, so I've added some flowers along with that. They don't necessarily have to go with the bird, but I try to at least get things that from my memory are things that I associated with birds about that same time of year. So some of them are just things that from my memories and my childhood and things like that as far as the flowers and what I thought um, I remembered and associated with the birds, but they don't have a real connection per se. Some of them do, but not all of them. Um, I'm focusing all on just main birds, birds that you'll see here. All the flowers you can see here uh, as well. So um, get out in the springtime, walk around. Even in the neighborhood here, um, you're going to see a lot of birds, you're going to see a lot of wildflowers, and also Hopefully there'll be some gardens around here that you'll actually attract like hummingbirds and things. You'll see those as well. But um, does anybody have any questions uh, as far as or any comments about birding? Has, has anybody done any birding, seen anything interesting lately? I've heard um, some of the songs change already the, and as early as January. I think the chickadees yeah. start doing their no more group feeding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they so start separating, yeah. I'd like to hear more about that or whatever you want to present. Okay. Um, it's moving into the season where the birds start singing courtship song, mm -hmm. territory song. The chickadees will start doing that early. Owls are actually breeding now, so they'll actually start nesting in March and April. And the chicks will start, you know, the owlets will start hatching in March and April. So um, when I was doing owl surveys, what we'd do is we'd go out and we didn't look for the owls, we'd listen for them. But we always did it in April and March. And that could be pretty cold and damp, <laughs> especially when you were doing it between midnight and 5 o'clock in the morning. Oh, wow. So, um, But they found that the owls called, because we started doing it at 6 o'clock at night and doing it all the way down to 5 o'clock at different sections. And so you'd go out three times during a, a, the first part of the owl surveying 10-year uh, period. And then they found by the halfway through that 10 years, five years later, everybody's getting most of the calls from, you know, midnight to five o'clock in the morning. So they ended up, you only had to go out once and uh, stay out for 12 hours. <laughs> well, not 12 hours, but that five hour period, six, uh, six hour period, but with everything else you had to do, it usually took about 12 hours. Um, but the, that's when you hear most of the calls. And we'll listen to one owl call today, and that's probably the most common owl that uh, we have around the area, and the one you most often hear. Anybody know what that one is? Barred owl, yeah. Yeah, the barred owl. So let's get started with the slideshow and uh, let's see what happens. So who do we have here? Robin. Robin. Do robins go south for the winter? No, not, not all of them, most of them. And then we have some that stay here year round. And we also get a lot of Canadian owls. They, this is as far south as they go. Yeah. What are they looking for for food this time of year? Anything. Anything. <laughs> well, they're not getting a lot of worms. So, berries primarily, yeah, they're eating fruits, you know, so if you have uh, a garden and you want to attract robins in the wintertime, get things like viburnums or um, small fruiting apples that have, a, you know, they, they tend to be persistent on the tree during the winter and the flocks of, of things like robins and cedar waxwings 
this time of year is primarily be bo bohemian wax wings, but um, they'll come and they'll come to those trees and feed off from them. But that's how those birds survive. Some birds that typically would be feeding on insects and berries and things in the wintertime will also actually go to the feeders. So you can put like dried cranberries in the, the feeders or raisins, mealworms. And you can buy either live mealworms or dried. They like the live ones, but <clears throat> they tend to freeze up anyway, so <laughs> especially here in Maine. So robins. Um, robin is in the thrush family. It has blue eggs. All the thrushes have blue eggs. And you'll see that in a couple of the slides I put out. And this is what he sounds like. Very typical. There are a couple other birds that sound something like robins. And we'll see those next. Is that their mating call? Or That's a typical, typical song. Okay. All right? Um, why do the birds sing? <laughs> we said something about it already oh, with the chickadee. Territory. territory. And, and, and mating. Yep. Yeah. So it's um, attracting a female. The. That'll go on forever. Let's go to the next picture. Um, when a bird sings, and primarily in the northern hemisphere, it's only the males that sing, have a song. And then in the southern hemisphere, both sing. And they're not really sure why. Um, but there are a few birds that both of them sing, uh, like mockingbirds. Both of them will sing. But most of our birds in the north, the male are the primary singer. And then as far as their calls, which they have a whole repertoire of calls that they'll do, both the male and the female will do it. And that's their way of communicating other things that are going on in their daily life. But when I think of robins, don't want to block that. When I'm thinking of robins, the flower that comes to mind with me is apple blossoms. You know, the robins are coming. They're, a lot of times they nest in apple trees as well, if there's a lot of fruit trees around, um, because there's a lot of insects, and they're insect eaters as well as worm eaters. And so you'll get um, robins. Robin makes a, a nice little uh, cup nest, straw on the outside, mud on the inside, and lays the blue eggs. But um, they'll nest on just about anything. Uh, as far as being up high, as long as it's got a shelf-like structure that they can put it in, whether it's a, on top of a branch, on a bough of a fir, or in a crotch of a tree someplace, or on a ledge underneath a building. Um, they like to go anywhere. Excuse me. Stay over this way. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. So here's the bluebird song. And somehow I jumped ahead. All right. So the bluebird is uh, a bird that typically we think of as flying south and coming back in the spring. But we're finding more and more bluebirds are staying here year round. Uh, I've had a pair at my place for the last, well, I've been at, at the farm since 2011. And we've had bluebirds every, every year, all year long. Um, don't see them all the time because they're probably going into the area woods and getting cover in there. But when it's warm and it's bright, they're out flying around. And I see them in the trees around the farm. They, um, when I think of bluebirds, I think of them being in open fields with wooded areas that they can go in and out of. They're insect eaters. Uh, but they will, in the wintertime, they'll go to feeders and uh, feed on fruits, if you put fruits out. Mealworms especially. They love the mealworms, we, we're either dry or um, live. But when I think of them as far as fields, because my place, it's all hay fields. That's what we do as far as a, a um, product. It's the, our main product at the farm. But I keep the edges of the field wild. So the things that I have in it are milkweed, um, asters, like the New England aster with the monarch butterfly on here, Queen Anne's lace, 
valerian. A um, lot of flowers, wildflowers that are out there that I can see. I love having them. It attracts the, the, the birds and attracts the insects to feed the birds and also feed, feed other things. But the plants are great. They're colorful. They add to the environment. They add to the, the diversity. So I don't want a sterile hay field with nothing in it. The hay itself, I want to be as clean as possible, but my edges, I let it go. Yeah. My father-in-law, he was old hat. He didn't want anything around his hay fields. Round up everywhere. So I haven't done that at all. I don't care about the dandelions. The dandelions are good for the whatever animal is using my hay. Sometimes it's not so good if you're using it for mulch because you may end up with dandelions and everything. But dandelions are great. Rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, male and female, they're different, but in this case, there are bird, most birds that you have a very bright male and a very plain female, the female is the only one that goes to the nest. But in the uh, grosbeaks, both male and female will sit on the nest and also feed. Um, so you've got a female that looks very much like a sparrow, bigger, a little bit bigger, that very bright white uh, supercilium on the eye. Um, is a good distinguishing mark, but um, that very bright red on the breast. The other thing, interesting, interesting thing about the rosebeak is most people don't know it, but there are red underneath its wings as well. All right, so I don't have that, but here's his here's song, and think about the robin song when you listen to this one. I think. Oops. I gotta use this. Probably should be using this anyway. Does it sound like the robin? A little bit. Most people say this is a robin with an operatic voice. <laughs> it's much clearer, it's not quite as bubbly as the robin. Yeah. It tends to be very clear. But the note arrangement is sort of very similar. And when I think of flowers for this, I think of spring again, early spring. I think of hardwoods. Um, they like to be way up and high in the trees when they're singing. So this is what I see. Oh, what am I doing? All right. So. I'm moving things, that's why I don't like this. Here we go. All right. Um, lady slippers, trilliums, trout lily, they're all early spring, usually from anywhere from the end of April through to uh, June. That's what's out there in the woods. And they tend to grow in those hard, deciduous woods underneath in the shadows of the trees in the understory and really brighten up the spring woodlands. Any questions on what we've said so far or anything? I was just wondering if um, birds like holly berries, because I have two holly bushes but I haven't seen the birds on them. Most ilex, holly is an ilex and most ilex are actually toxic ah. so even most animals don't eat those. There are toxic berries to humans that a lot of birds do eat. Poison ivy, for one. Birds will devour poison ivy berries, which are a, almost a clear white berry on that vine after a very foamy yellow flower. But um, they can eat it like crazy and not be bothered at all. We get near it and we're covered with dermatitis. Winter berry. Again, it's an ilex, it's a, another holly. Birds will go to it, but it's last resort type of things. Primarily, that's why in the wintertime, uh, at Christmas time, people use a lot of ilex. Uh, it, it's ilex verticillata. Um, it's persistent, and then when you bring it in the house, they all fall off, <laughs> make a mess. And basically, that's what it does out in the, in the wild, too. Eventually, they fall off, 
usually they're, they're, even though they're persistent on the tree, you touch the tree and they start falling off. Some birds will eat them if it's the last thing they can, can get to eat. Um, the real persistent berries that they like to eat are um, bittersweet. Bittersweet has kept mockingbirds Asian, here. Not well, it is. That's what they like. Um, but it's not a good one to have, for sure. Uh, it's in one of those invasives. It's, a, it's amazing how many invasive species birds like. But our native plants don't like them. Um, honeysuckle. The berry isn't persistent. Birds, it's not, again, it's not a particularly um, favored fruit for birds, but they will eat it. And they spread it like crazy, because it's, as soon as the, the seed hits the ground, boom, it's there. <laughs> I just cleared eight acres of honeysuckle out of my woods. And I still probably have another 10 that I have to clear out. And that all started from two shrubs that were planted at the turn of the century, turn of the 18th into 1900s, uh, in my family farm. My father-in-law bulldozed those out of the front yard and pushed them down into the woods, thinking they'd just die out. They didn't, and they spread. And the butt end of the honeysuckle, that, that main bush, is that big around. So. <clears throat> it's been quite a job. Oh, um, the viburnums are good ones to plant for birds. Um, dogwoods, again, like I said, the small fruiting uh, apple trees, the crab apples. You know, those are the kind of things you want to plant, and all of them can be native. Uh, especially the viburnums. The issue with the viburnums at this point is there is a um, a beetle that was introduced from Asia that um, it's the viburnum lace leaf beetle. It will, the um, high bush cranberry, arrow woods, things like that, leather, uh, it doesn't affect the leather leaf viburnums, but uh, some of the more tender leaf ones, it will wipe them out and it will eventually kill the tree or the shrub. So you have to be careful where you get. And unfortunately, if you want to get rid of those beetles, you have to use some kind of insecticide, which I don't promote. But um, I still plant high bush cranberry and hope it will last for a while anyway. Um, but it eventually will go. The other issue, oh. no. So, um, maybe you're getting to this, but I was wondering if there's any tricks on remembering bird songs or if there's any soft where they test you and you can... You, very much so. Um, with birdsong, you want to think of mnemonics. Say, uh, like the barred owl. Anybody know what a mnemonic for a barred owl is? Who cooks for you all? Who cooks oh, for you all? <laughs> okay? <laughs> or you can, oh, sweet, no. Um, yeah, what, what, what were you going to say? That's the only one I know. In Florida, we were told that was a southern bird. And oh. that, the, that the northern one just said, who cooks for you? <laughs> they do both. They, they do both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, does, it, it does have that sort of drag out. That's where the you all came in. Um, and I've seen barred owls from Florida all the way up to Maine and Canada. So um, they cover the whole, uh, pretty much the whole world. <laughs> you can find them everywhere, barred owls. But anyway, um, the... Uh, White-throated sparrow, the mnemonic for that is, oh, Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. If you get a little bit farther north than here, it's, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. <laughs> um, in the, the, I have a white-throated sparrow on the slideshow, and when you hear that, it goes, oh, sweet, oh, oh old Sam Peabody, or, oh, sweet Canada. It doesn't repeat. But, so... And birds have dialects, and they have, uh, yeah. If you go to one part of the country, it'll do, primarily you'll be able to recognize the song, but it may be slightly different than what you hear at home. 
birds learn their songs. They learn it from listening to their parents, and they also listen to, uh, learn it from listening to other birds in their area. And that's how they, they develop their own song, and they pass that on to their offspring. If you take a wild bird and you put it in a cage and put it isolated from other, other birds, it won't have a song. It will, it will, will sing, or it may call, but it won't have the same song as its parents. Um, then, of course, you get mimics that do all kinds of singing. They mimic all kinds of birds, and it's really hard to determine which is their song. But the mockingbird, gray catbird, brown thrasher, those are the three that we typically think of main imitators. When you think about those birds, the gray catbird doesn't repeat. It just keeps going. The brown thrasher repeats twice. So if it's, you know, if it's imitating a robin, it'll do two robin songs. Then it'll go on to something else. It might be a car horn. You know, it, 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 you never know what it's going to come up with. Um, gray catbird also does its name. It does a meow. So, um, but, and then the mockingbird repeats three or more times. Now, that's not say that every time they do that, but that's the persistent way they, they call. One, two, or three repeats. All right. So then we get into scarlet tanagers. And scarlet tanager is another woodland bird. It likes hard, deciduous woods again, but it tends to like wet woods. Again, it's way up high. You hardly ever see them. You hear them singing. Now, with the, we had the robin, nice bubbly song. You had the rose-breasted grosbeak. It had that uh, very clear, very precise operatic song. This one sounds like he's got a cold. I can do this without. Do you hear it's a little bit more raspy? I'm only going to do it once. I grabbed a, a, a short one. But that will go continually. It's not like they the recording that I put on is a clip out of a, their song. And when you're seeing these birds, the female is different, but again, these two birds tend the, oh, there was more in there, <laughs> tend, tend the nest. The male doesn't sit on the nest as far as I know. And when I said they like, whoops. When I say they like wet woods, so things I think of as skunk cabbage. I think of like a, a, a maple grove, a maple swamp with um, marsh marigold and John, uh, jack in the pulpits and skunk cabbage. Um, as far as skunk cabbage, most people don't necessarily identify it as the right plant. A lot of people look at and see false heliobore, which is a tall plant with the branches out and then it has a foamy, I don't want to say foamy, but it, almost like a con tassel um, type flower on the top. Um, but, and they think that's skunk, skunk cabbage. But really, skunk cabbage is this plant that has a flower, a big purple, uh, almost jack-in-the-pulpit-like flower with a spathe inside, and ends up with a cluster of red berries, just like the jack-in-the-pulpit when it actually goes to seed. But its leaves are basal, and they spread out like a cabbage. Um, doesn't form a head, but it opens up with big, broad leaves, more like a plantain, a, or, or um, plantation lily, um, plantain. Um, I can't think of the word. Plantation lily. Pardon? <laughs> oh, well, that's all right. It doesn't matter. That's a garden variety anyway. All right. Gray catbird. 
So the gray catbird, uh, again, it's in the thrush family. So it has blue eggs. It tends to like really thick, crowded, short, shrubby plants um, to, to be in. I think of, if it's around a home, a really old Phascythia or really overgrown lilacs uh, will attract um, gray catbird. The other thing that they like uh, in the wild is Virginia creeper, because it tends to make big mats if it goes up in the trees, or sumac, um, which will form a big grove, and they like those. So, and I, again, as I said, they tend to be a mimic, um, and they repeat once. Phew, this one is doing more repeating than it should. <laughs> but the typical, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Um, and the recordings are all, like I said, the recordings are all different. But it does, not every one is repeated. You, you, every so often there's a repeat. But it keeps changing a lot more than the others would. When I think of the flowers, like I said, I think of Virginia creeper. And um, growing up, uh, I grew up on Peaks Island off Portland and um, had a lot of viney plants out there. Virginia creepers, um, one part of the island was covered with the wisteria because it had just gone wild from some time in the probably in the 1800s when they brought the plant over there and it just spread across one of the woodland areas on the island. But Virginia creeper, I think of it as blueberries and red leaves in the fall. That's how I think of it mostly. Um, very bright, very colorful. The birds like the berries. Uh, mockingbirds like them. The catbird likes them. Um, and sumac makes a heavy cover with opening spaces underneath because it tends to grow up in a grove, nothing underneath and all the canopy is on the top. The birds can fly around in underneath there but still be hidden. Do birds like sumac as far as edible? That's the berry, that's not the flower by the way, that's the berry. We can eat it. People say they do but I've never seen them eating it. Yeah, they do. Um, Again, it's not one of their favorite foods, but if there's snow on the ground and they can't find anything else, they will devour this stuff. For us, it's sour. It tastes like a bitter lemon. Um, you can make a nice lemonade-like drink out of it, a pink lemonade. Tastes great. You can make a tea out of it. If you're allergic to cashews, don't do it. <laughs> it's in the same family as cashew. It's a Rus family. So, um, does anybody else know what other plant is Rus? Rus toxicodendron, or Rus radicans, or toxicodendron radicans. All the same plant, just they keep changing the name. <laughs> it's poison ivy. Oh. Poison ivy is in the same family as, as, as um, sumac and cashews. So if you're allergic to cashews, you're probably really allergic to poison ivy. All right. So great plants. This is another thrush. Anybody know which one it is? Pardon? No, this is a thrush. This is the hermit thrush. And one of the ways you tell it's a hermit thrush is that it's got the speckled breast like a um, wood thrush. But when you look at it, this tail. It's really rusty looking. It's got more of a rusty looking tail and then more of an olive gray to um, a darker brown, grayish brown back. Very light colored stomach with the, with the speckles. When it sings, it has a very clear whistle, then it's followed by its trill. Um, each of the thrushes you can identify by their song. This is the, this is the hermit thrush. 
Do you have the whistle? All right. It's a bird that likes the understory, running around on the wood floor. It likes um, an open wood with a lot of small plants and shrubs on the, on the floor that it can get in and out of. It sits on the floor and it scratches. And it's looking for insects primarily, uh, but it will eat some fruits and, and, and uh, nuts as well, or seed. And when I think of it, I think of plants. The plant I think of, because the, where I see this bird the most, I have it on the farm, but I see it up in Kennebago where I go fly fishing. It's um, just above Rangeley, and the woods are full of those and veeries. Those are the two birds I see up there as far as thrushes. I, I tend to think of that sound more towards the evening. Is there any? Yeah. Anything thrushes tend to sing really early in the morning or in the evening, primarily. During the day, you probably don't hear them unless you hear them calling, which might be a peat or, you know, um, beer, beer type of calls. But when they're singing, it's evening song. That's what most people think of thrush song as evening song. Yeah. Um, they're nest on the ground, but as again, you see it's blue eggs, thrush. Like to get underneath something, uh, under that understory uh, cover. Not necessarily completely covered, but you can see what it's primarily made of. It's hard to see in this picture, but it's pine needles. There's a lot of times what they line the nest with. For a plant, up there where I see them the most is hazelnut. And this is beaked hazel. And it has very small, well, you have two flowers here. It's a, on the same plant. It's male and female. So the red is the male flower. And that's what's going to produce the pollen. And the cat can, well, excuse me, I'm doing it backwards. The cat can is the male flower. It's going to produce the pollen. Lots of it. And it's airborne. So it's going to spread through the air and it's going to hit the little red female flower. A lot of plants that have catkins, um, alders, cherry, not cherry, um, whew, my mind's gone blank here. Um, the birches, thank you. <laughs> birches, the um, poplars, they all have catkins and very small, which are the male flowers. They start small, they open up in the springtime, they swell up, produce a lot of pollen, and it goes into those little tiny female flowers. And then on like the alder, you get little tiny pine cones that will persist. So um, the, a lot of people collect them for <coughs> uh, decorations but, um, and use them in small crafts and things. But in most of the catkins, the female also expands out, and then it bursts. Birch seeds you find all over the ground this time of year. And they look like little um, <coughs> fleur-de-lis. Or when we're talking with kids about birds, we ask them to go out in the snow and find swallows flying in the snow. Because they look like little birds flying as well. Yeah. Anybody know what this one is? Small bird. Its Latin is, well, they've changed it, but the, the Latin that I know for it is Truglodytes Truglodytes. And they, they changed the species name, so I'm not sure what it is. Um, I can't remember. But Truglodyte is, well, Troglodyte was a caveman, all right? So this is a little bird that, they, that likes the dark crevices and things in root balls and in rock, rocky areas. It likes um, blowdowns because it can get into the roots. The very first one I saw, which they've changed the name of, by the way, um, was out in Banff National Park in Alberta. And I was walking along Lake Louise, and there was this little bird going in and out of the bank and the holes in the bank and the roots of the tree along the path. It was my first winter wren. Well, I guess I have to change that now because now I can get two birds for one. Because <laughs> in the past few years, they've changed, they've divided the winter wren species into two, two um, families, Pacific wren and winter wren. 
So I saw a Pacific Wren. But when I saw her, it was still a winter wren. So I get both. <laughs> um, but they like these places where blowdowns. And they'll get in there, and they'll look for insects and things like that. And they're creeping around all the time. They're very hard to get pictures of <laughs> because they're moving around so much. They have the longest song, continuous song, of any bird in the US. Wow. The recordings don't always give you as long as they play, but here we go. All right, that's without stopping. <laughs> you know, the mockingbirds and things, they sing continually, but there are breaks in between, it even breaks in between each section of their song. So this guy just sings his heart out. Good lungs <laughs> for a little guy. Because <laughs> he's only about that big. He's very small. Um, again, they like uh, damp, woods. They like a lot of understory. They like rocky places. They like to be near water. So when I think of the bird, when I think of the plants that he likes, I think of the understory, what plants are there, and the one that really jumps out to me was golden thread. And golden thread is a small ground cover. It's viney. It spreads throughout the forest floor. And has these very small star-like flowers and large yellow stamens. But, um, and you might see that winter wren hopping around in that golden thread. And it's called golden thread because if you dig this up, the, the roots are bright yellow. So that's how it gets its name. The nest, it builds a bower. It actually makes a, a, a nest and completely almost closes it in and then just leaves a hole that it can go in and out of. When it does that, it um, takes, and the reason I have the moss here, the hair cap knot, moss, is what it does is it takes that moss and lines the whole inside of the, the bower. So, and of course we get a little bit of, of reindeer lichen on top of that moss as well, and a little bit of British soldier lichen, or matchstick lichen. Mm. Yeah. Um, a lot of people when they see golden thread, they think it's a clover because it's got three leaves. Um, but unlike the clover, instead of being smooth leaves, these are a little bit scalloped. Everybody know what this one is? American goldfinch. Yeah. We do have other goldfinches in the United States, but in Maine, it's just the American goldfinch. And this time of year, it looks more like the female. This is a female, but the male looks a lot like the female. If you're looking at them and you're seeing them, they're starting to get yellow. They're just starting. Um, they have a little nest. It's probably only about the size of a cup. Um, it tends to be filled and uh, covered with different kinds of fibers. It could be milkweed fibers, it could be thistle fibers, it could be feathers, it could be fur. Use a lot of that. And then it's mixed in with birch bark, um, other different natural fibers that it can find as far as grasses and things like that. But a perfect little cup, it's always in, some, usually like in the crotch of a small tree or a shrub. And their song is Eh, sort of a little rattle. A little, little bit of a, a song. And their flight song's a little bit different, but it used about the same, but a little bit different. And a lot of little chips and things when it's feeding and so forth. When I think of plant, what do you think of as a plant when you think of a goldfinch? Apple trees? Okay. Thistle. That's what I thought of. Black oil sunflowers, yeah. Sunflowers aren't, well, the big ones that we get the seeds from aren't necessarily native to the United States, but like uh, the largest ones are the Russian sunflowers. Um, but we do have uh, heliopsis, different types of heliopsis that are um, heliotropes, heliops, heliotopsis. Um, the sunflower plants 
that um, do really do really well here and are native. So, but primarily when I think of them, I think of them going after thistle, and we have bull thistle, we have Canada thistle, there's milk thistles, all different kinds of native native thistle thistles that we have. Um, some people call Canadian thistle or Canada thistle an invasive now. Uh, probably because they don't like it because when they were running in fields with kids they were stepping on stuff because it's a basal root and then it grows up this huge plant. Mm -hmm. But it's a really neat plant. It attracts a lot of insects, butterflies, bees, and goldfinches. All right, this sort of looks like a thrush, doesn't it? It's a warbler. All right, this is an oven bird. And again, it probably builds a small nest that's sort of like an oven, so it's a bower. But it's an insect eater. It's in the same area you'd find the, the thrushes. But this is its song. What do I do? Okay, yes. It's an oven bird, but what it does, it says, teacher, 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 or teach, 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 teach. If you play that song in the woods, if you have a recording and you do that, probably within five minutes, you'll have several of them calling back to you. Uh, one of those that really uh, likes to repeat, it will come back to you. So they're a thrush-like bird, smaller than a thrush, but they're a bigger, bigger of the, the warblers. It tends to be on the lower story. It's not way up high like most warblers. Um, the one thing that makes it a little bit different than a, than a thrush is it's got a rust stri stripe right down through the middle of its head with darker lines outlining it. And you can just see it right here. Very definite eye rings. Um, do, do birds tend to have a similar anatomy to ours to produce song? Good question. Um, birds do not, well, it's similar, but different. We have a larynx. Birds have a syrinx. With a syrinx, they have two air pathways. Or two, so two separate voice boxes that they sing with. Thrushes can sing two notes at the same time, two different notes at the same time. Most birds just sing and their calls using both uh, size of this syrinx to do the same thing. So thrushes, that's why a thrush's song is so ethereal and so um, complex, is because it's singing multiple notes, different notes at the same time. It's really neat to, to take a um, spectrogram of the, the song or break that song down or slow it down. You take a, a, the um, hermit thrush's song, you slow it down, it sounds like whale song. It's really neat. Yeah. Uh, so when I think of the, the oven bird, I think of the understory. There you see that almost a bower. It's got a little bit of a canopy over the top of it. You can see that orange mark through there. But I think a hobble bush. Hobble bush is a viburnum. It tends to be a low growing viburnum tends to spread out across the floor, forest floor, thus the hobble part. You trip up over it all the time if you're trying to, to go through it. Um, after the flowers go by, it has red berries that turn blue. When they're blue, they're actually edible, unlike most of the viburnums. Most viburnums aren't edible for people. Some are. A lot of them are used as medicinals, but um, great plants. Yes. Do birds, like, do they winter in their nests, or do they only build nests in the spring? Especially when they get like a winter wind. Most birds abandon their nests. They don't really use their nests in the wintertime. Owls might, because they use, some are cavity nesters, or they use big nests, so they might sit in there all winter long, they use it as a perch. Some birds will, uh, if they're box nesters, will go into a box. So sometimes you put up boxes up in the wintertime just as shelter boxes. Yeah. Um, 
but most birds, if they're a nest builder, they abandon it. Swallows will, will rebuild on the same nest. Phoebes will rebuild on the same nest. Cowbirds will have multiple layers if they use, if they use their own nest. <laughs> Cowbirds are notorious for laying their eggs in other birds' nests and just abandoning their young. But when they do have a nest of their own, they, they tend to stack them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some birds do and some birds don't. Most birds don't, I would say. Yeah. It's also, oh, yes. The type of viburnum. It's called hobble bush. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Do you know what this is? It's blue. <laughs> it's not a bluebird. No, and this is actually not blue. It tends to be a very iridescent gray, but it's very has very refractive feathers. So when it's in the right light, it shines blue. Uh, it's an indigo bunting, and the female is just another brown, little brown job, LBJ. Yeah. Uh, well, this one is. It's been wet, and so it's fluffed up. Yeah. Um, indigo buntings, um, they are throughout Maine. Um, sometimes you see a lot of them. Other times you don't see any. Um, the first one I ever saw, I grew up in Portland area. I'd never seen one. I came up to the farm where my wife is, uh, grew up here in Appleton, and the first time I was here, there it was right in the middle of the field, on a, a shrub growing in the middle of the field. Uh, we have them nest at the, not every time, but occasionally nest at the farm, and so we have whole broods of them. So one year I had a small patch of corn. The fledglings and the parents were just devouring the, the, the seed top off the, not the corn, but the, the tassel on the top. Uh, they were just feeding on that, uh, the male flower. It was, it was really great to see, and they're not the best singer in the world, <laughs> but they have a little song. In a way, it's almost sparrow-like. Yeah. So. They like overgrown fields. So they like things like, oops hit the right button here. They like, like I said, overgrown fields, so they like meadow sweet, steeple bush, which are both viburnums, uh, viburnums, um, spireas, spirea. So this is spirea latifolia, which is broadleaf uh, vi uh, spirea, and tomatosa, which is the steeple bush. Um, Steeple bush is the one that you tend to find on the, in the fields and people don't like it because it's, it grows up and it's a woody shrub and it just gets, it will keep spreading if you don't clean it out, if it's a hay field or a blueberry field. Um, the latifolia, the spirea meadowsweet, is, tends to be on the edges of stuff. It grows around places and will big, big patches. But This is the, the full open flower. Oh, okay. So you, and you're seeing a little bit of the yellow, so it's probably starting to go by a little bit. But they tend to go to a pink. They'll start out really white, and then they'll go pink, and then they'll go brown. Um, they both are great herbs. Uh, bare aspirin was a, initially d derived from this plant. Um, it's an interesting story. It was back in the 1800s mid-1800s, a pharmacist had a mother who was severely arthritic and couldn't find any relief for her, and he tried and tried and tried, and um, finally he was almost ready to give up, and he was talking to some people in a village where he lived, and they said, go talk to the old lady down the road, and she was an herbalist, you know, a wise woman. And he went to her, and he said, oh, you've got to use the Bach from this, or use this. 
the spirea latifolia and the tomatosa, the spireas are full of salicylic acid. All right? Salicins. Aspirin. So that's where Bear aspirin from. He took the plant home, he decocted the, the medicine out of it, and treated his mother and gave her a lot of relief. So great plants. Another story about meadowsweet is that when the colonial, colonials were here, um, when they first came in, they used to gather this in the spring and spread all over their cabin floors. Because cooking all went along with the house all closed up, they were cooking on hearths, fats and things would splatter on the floor, they would get rancid. This had a very sweet, almondy aroma to it. And so when they walked on it and crushed it, it would get rid of that stale smell. Actually, it's from the bark, the, the, oh, the, bark. The, the actual twigs of the plant. Mm -hmm. yep. You can get it from um, poplars, the aspens. You can get it from cherry. Um, salicins are in a lot of things. But um, the one I think of mostly is, is uh, quaking aspen. It's a good one. So you can, you can uh, actually tincture or decoct the bark from um, poplar and... and make a, a, a aspirin type drink out of it or tincture. All right. I don't have a song for this one. Yes. Where do the indigo buntings nest? Uh, they're a, a shrub type nester. So they don't like to be real close to the ground but sort of midpoint. And um, so and they like cover. They, they're sort of um, reclusive that way. So they like to be hidden. So it's hard to find their nests. Yeah. Um, I don't have a recording for this one, but um, what do we have? <laughs> hummingbird. The only hummingbird that is really common east of the Mississippi, the ruby throat. We have a few that are coming, and every so often you hear a report of another type. They have vagrants. Vagrants <laughs> being birds that come from another place and come here for a short time, and then they disappear again. The hummingbird. But you hear their wings. Pardon? But you hear their wing. I mean, you can hear them. You can hear them, yeah. The, you hear that humming from the wings, the beating of the wings. Uh, they do make little chipping sounds. When the male is mating or he's fighting, he's doing this big loop dive up and down and up and down. And all touring that flight, he's chip, 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 you know? Um, but as far as a song, they don't really have one. They, um, they use color as their communication. The, that little bright red under his chin can be folded up or it can be opened up. And what they do is they flare it out when they're really in the mating process um, or battle process as far as fighting with another male to, for territory. We have a few that stay here, lots of them up north where there's a lot of lichens and stuff in the trees. They love to nest on just an open branch. They'll sit that right on little nest, which is only not much bigger than a walnut, half a walnut. Um, six, six chicks can fit into a teaspoon, all right? Um, and you can see it's so small that even that little hummingbird is only, you know, sits up high in it. They make it out of, what do they make it out of, other than lichen? What? Spider web. Spider web. Yeah. Oh, man. Hummingbirds go and they gather the spider web. They have to be very careful because yeah. they're small enough. Hummingbirds can get hung up in spider web. And I almost put a couple pictures in here, but I said, no, nah, let's not do it. <laughs> um, I do have some good pictures of hummingbirds and spider webs. But the other thing, um, we put up feeders and attract hummingbirds uh, to our camps or our homes, you have to watch out for one thing, especially if you live in places like this in rural, in rural areas, not woodland areas so much, but rural areas uh, where there's a lot of fields and things, praying mantis. Praying mantises will get on the feeder if it's in an area where they are, and they'll sit there and they can actually grab a hummingbird and eat it. Yep, yep. 
How many birds the smallest bird we have in the state? The second smallest is a ruby crown kinglet in their migratory. So um, great little birds. When I think of them, there's a couple plants that I think of primarily. And these are plants that are native, and they're um, plants that the hummingbirds go to. They're tube uh, flowers that are developed primarily for hummingbirds and bees, that, or butterflies or moths, that have long tongues that they can stick into the tube and get the nectar out of. Um, that's the spotted jewel weed. Uh, some people call it touch me not, because when you hit the seeds, poof, they pop. Um, and cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. The, um, the, the, anybody know anything about jewelweed as far as what it might be used for? Um, poison, ivy. poison ivy, yeah. The other plant that's good for poison ivy is um, sweet fern. Sweet fern and, and jewelweed grow in, tend to, a lot of times grow in the same areas that poison ivy grows. And if you take those, um, the jewelweed is really easy to do because it's very gelatinous. Um, a lot of liquid comes out of it when you do it. And it, you rub that on, it neutralizes the oils from the poison ivy. Um, so is it the leaf or the flower that you're you can, The whole plant as far as the jewelweed. Yep. On the uh, sweet fern, it's the leaves. The other part with sweet fern, I, I should have brought a picture of that too, but um, the sweet fern is great for black flies. It repels them. It's very aromatic. You rub it on, it'll last for 20 minutes or so, and the black flies won't bother you, but you have to keep doing it. So you, you can't do it. I tried tincturing it once, and the black fly, I was fly fishing, the black flies went away for about maybe a minute or two. Bloop, right back. So the tincture didn't work real well. What's the name of that plant again for black flies? Sweet fern. Yeah. Anybody see this bird? This is a bird that people are coming from the Midwest prairie lands, coming back to Maine to see. Um, it's um, bobolink. Bobolink like big open fields. And a lot of places what they're doing is they are turning those into horticultural fields, plowing them up, and the birds have no place to go. Either that or they're haying them so much that there's no long grasses anymore. So the birds move to wherever they can find long grass, open fields, bordered by woods. But they're really a prairie bird, um, and people are actually coming to Maine to see bobolinks. They have a very bubbly song. Oh, maybe I got the wrong one. That's a call. It's not a song. I'm sorry. I brought the wrong one. Um, but anyway, okay. So they got a really bubbly song that they sing, primarily the male sings, when he's flying. And he flies with his wings tipped down. And they f flap and they can hover. Um, but great... It's black with a white cap and yellow um, rump. Let's see. That almost sounds like the oven bird. Here he is again. And again, so they love the hay fields. Um, and when I think of the hay fields, one of the things I think of in the fall is goldenrod. All right. And goldenrod is a. a um, a plant that I also think of with, with chickadees and downy woodpeckers. And the reason for that is that, um, moving backwards again, the um, goldenrod is known to have galls on them, and the galls are capsules that in, uh, are basically homes, protective homes for insects. Galls can also be a virus or they can be a fungal too, but primarily when I think of them, I think for insects. And goldenrod has three. It has a ball gall, it has an elliptical gall, and it has an apex gall. The ball gall and the elliptical gall um, have um, 
a white winged fly in the ball gall, a elliptical gall is a solid algo moth, and the apex gall is a biting midge. All right, so the midge and the moth hatch out in the fall. The white winged fly in the ball gall stays all winter long, and um, but what happens is it pupates, and the downy woodpecker or the chickadee will go and they'll break those open and eat that as a protein source in the winter time. So a lot of times you find them all broken open in the winter time. The insects, yeah, um, insects produce, when the, when the parent lays the egg, what it does is it injects a little bit of a chemical into the plant, an enzyme, that causes the plant to mutate. It doesn't hurt the plant per se, uh, but it deforms it. It's specific to the insect as far as what shape it has and um, what's going to happen to the plant. So the egg is inside that spot, it, the, the, it swells, when the egg hatches, the lava eats away at the pith inside the plant, and that's what it's feeding on. Um, and then just before it pupates, it drills up through the, and leaves just a little bit of skin over the, drills a hole up to the surface, and leaves just a little bit of the skin of the plant, the dermis of the plant, there to seal off that, that hole, and then in the, in the spring when it hatches from the pupa, it has um, a little proboscis on the front of it that it uses to push through that, that, that little fiber over the hole and emerges as an adult fly. Red-winged blackbirds, all right? Again, male and female, the male is one of those bright colors, it stays away from the nest. It'll sit above it, but the female is always the one on the nest. Um, those epaulets, the red, you only see in the spring. By the middle of the summer, they folded those up. Unless they're flying, sometimes you see them when they're flying. But they fold them up, and all you see is the yellow band underneath it. Um, their song, they have a conconquery. Yeah, and a lot of chips and chirps and things like that, but that conconquery yeah, is a typical song. When I think of red-winged blackbirds, these are the plants I think of. Broadleaf cattail and pickerel weed could be button bush, it could be spireas, you know, things that grow along the water, uh, gray dogwood, things like that. But they love to nest in cattails. Phragmites is another one, common reed. They like to, to be in that as well, but we don't like that plant. No. It's another invasive. Phragmites. It's a tall, that really tall, grassy-like stuff that has the purpley plume on the top and the in the late summer. You can see it, the place I see it up here, which I, I wanted to stop and just pull it up, is if you're coming from Hannaford's out of Rockland, right there on Route 17, there's a big patch of it right on the side of the road. Not loose strife. Uh, not loose strife, no. It's not a flower, it's a grass. It's a true grass. Yeah. Um, and then pickerel weed. Pickerel weed is another aquatic plant, uh, broad leaf, uh, almost arrow shaped leaf and then it comes up with these purple lobelia-like flowers um, that turn into a nut head and you can actually canoe along through them and pick the nuts and eat them raw. Uh, you can also roast them and taste better, but... Um, so, how about the cattail? How many seed... This is a male and female flower, by the way, and this is broad, broad leaf cattail, and you can tell it's broad leaf because the male flower is sitting directly on top of the female flower. In narrow leaf cattail, which tends to be a briny water type, it likes to be you know, like saltwater um, ponds and things, it'll grow upland as well, but it will take salt water. It has the female flower sits at least a quarter of an inch to an inch above the female flower, the male flower does. 
produces copious amounts of pollen. You can eat the pollen by going out and just shaking the male flower into a, a bag, take it home, put it in stews. It sort of acts as a thickener. Um, you can put it in flour and bake it into your muffins or breads, that kind of thing. Very high in protein. Right? The female flower, when it's green, not when it's brown, but when it's green, you can cut that off, steam it, or saute it, and eat it like corn on the cob. The leaves, when they're first coming up through the ground in the summertime, pull one of those up. Looks sort of like a, a green onion or something like that. Take the white part. You say if it's thumb tender, you can pinch through it. It's edible. Of course, you could take it up and you can saute it and stuff. And it'll tender up. But you eat the white, not the green. It's too fibrous. Um, it tastes like cucumber. Has about the same sort of gelatinous, you know, sliminess to it like a cucumber. Um, but it's cooling. It's great. It's the plant has um, been used for, for coming up with um, medicine for burn victims. It's been used in third degree burn treatments because it's gelatinous and the gelatinous material out of it is cooling, it's antimicrobial, and it's antibiotic. All right? So great medicinal plant and a great edible plant. Oh yeah, rush seat type of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they'd have to be rolled in this case because they're broadleaf. But um, how many seeds do you think is in one cattail? Twenty billion. Twenty. Well, not quite that many. <laughs> Up to two million seeds per head. Tiny little things. And that's why when you go to and you see a, a big pond that's starting to get overrun with cattails that can happen pretty readily and what it does it will fill in it'll turn into a bog then it'll eventually it'll turn into dry land because it just fills up and it's it's uh, not readily decomposable the cattail itself sometimes didn't they used to use that for um, flotation in early life um oh, k, -Poc. k -Poc right. is really what they used yeah. uh, but during the war when you couldn't you know first world war Women and children were sent out to collect whatever fibers they could find. They'd collect milkweed. They'd collect um, cattail. Whatever they could find that had a lot of fiber to it, they would collect that and they would send it to the military and they'd make substitutes for the K-Pok type things. Yep. Couldn't get it because of the war. White-throated sparrow. Oh, Sam Peabody, not Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Uh, it's a sparrow. Most sparrows tend to be ground nesters. Not all of them, but some, most of them. Most of them have either a pure white egg with brown speckles or sort of a greenish egg with brown speckles. Um, it is the bird of the north. Most people think of it as a northern bird. Beautiful white. Uh, chin patch, the white stripes, and it has the little yellow patch just behind the beak over the eye and the supercilium. When I think of it, I think of either it being way up high, so up in the mountains, or along river banks and so forth, down low. It's everywhere in the north woods. When I was doing Bicknell thrush surveys, which is a bird that only nests at 2,500 feet or higher, all right, which is in, a big problem right now because its habitat is being lost not only here, but in the one place. It, it, it shows its swath of where it um, winter, I mean summers, is up the east coast, uh, from about mid-coast all the way up through New York and up through Maine and into Canada. Where do you think it winters? Basically two Caribbean islands. Yeah. And so and w if they're doing any forestry or stuff there, they're wiping out their habitat. They have uh, set up specific ranges in those places, so they're trying to protect them. Um, and it's so-so. The other issue here is 
their nesting areas, which is those high peaks, the highest peaks we have, what are we doing with them now? Towers. Putting wind towers on top of them. Those things spinning. Have you ever seen a pictures of what those, how many birds those things kill? Thousands. Thousands. Including things like bald eagles. Golden eagles are big birds. And those are birds that if you shot them, you would be sent to jail. But they're saying, they've changed the law. It used to be that even if you were a business or like a wind tower, you would be responsible for making sure those, that didn't happen. They've changed the law that if you have wind towers and a bird gets killed, even if it's a bald eagle, you didn't intend to do that, so it's not your fault anymore. If you have um, a barn that has barn owls, owls in it, and you decide, well, I don't want the barn anymore, I'm going to tear it down or burn it up, you can do it. No, no issue. You can, you know, the bird doesn't matter because you didn't intend to kill the bird. You just wanted to get rid of your building. You know, as a, as a, I'm not an ornithologist, but as a naturalist, my thing is to protect those things. Um, so I would think first about doing that, and I hope most people would. But, you know, the, the I don't want to get political. <laughs> so we'll just leave it at that. But so for plants, I thought of diapensia, which is a, um, um, a boreal high mountain plant. It grows on the top of ball uh, pate mountains um, in the rock crevices. And it comes up with big mats. It's a ground cover where it can find enough soil to be a ground cover. Um, and then the top of it, when it's in bloom, will be totally white. And then it has this little succulent-like uh, plant underneath it. Fireweed on the, the lower grounds. Fireweed is brilliant. Uh, purple flower, pink flower, uh, spiky. It likes to grow in places that have been burnt off, so that's one of the first things that will come back. But if you go up north, it's everywhere. You can see it around here as well, but not as much. And then virgin's bower, which is a clematis. It's a native clematis. And clematis, however you want to say it. It makes this, and it's called a bower because it, it covers, goes over the top of other plants and shrubs and makes this thick mass on top of the plants. You can get in underneath it. Have to be careful though because some people are, will get dermatitis from it. So um, not really bad, not like poison ivy, but it can be an irritant. But those are the kind of plants I think of when I think of um, the white throat sparrow. Song sparrow. This is what it sounds like. Little bubbly, little bit of a tr raspy trill at the end. Sparrows, the little brown jobs. <laughs> a lot of people have a lot hard time identifying them. This one's easy. The song is easy to identify, but when you think of a sparrow and it's got a black spot in the middle of its chest and stripes. It's a song sparrow. The only other one that I really know that has a black spot right in the middle of its chest is a tree sparrow, which is here now. It migrates back up north and is replaced by chipping sparrows, which doesn't ha looks almost exactly alike, but it doesn't have the black spot in the middle of its chest. The chipping sparrow doesn't. So great birds. I'm watching time because I'm... Um, So sparrows, I think of feeding on the ground, I think of fields, I think of uh, edges of woods, uh, places that have grown up. I thought of clovers. And we have a lot of clovers. Most of our clovers are non-natives. They were introduced. The red clover was introduced. Alsace clover was introduced, the white in, uh, clovers. The Rabbit tail, the hop leaf clovers, those are, n are natives, they're small ones. How do you think the red clover got here? Hmm? Well, it was used in medicinal, so it was an herbal. Um, it was used for upper respiratory um, stuff. You collect the flower heads and you decoct it or, or you steep it in something like honey and you use it as a cough medicine. 
But um, the other thing is, uh, it was used as a grain as well. Because you could take the flower heads and grind them up, and the seed is inside that head. And the whole plant, you're using the, the, the flower head and the seed that's in it as this grain substitute. You make a porridge out of it. When the Irish and the Scottish were going through the potato famines in Europe, or, or Great Britain, that's what they subsisted on, was clover. Yeah. So that's how most of our, what we think of as clover, came to here, we're in herb gardens. Warblers. Here's another little warbler. This is one of those that I see way up high in the trees in the early spring. It's a black-throated green warbler. And it has probably the most identifiable song. And it has one of those mnemonics that go with it. And it goes, C, C, Su, C, 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 Su, C, or Su, Su, C, Su. You see it both ways. But to me, it sounds like C, C, Su, Su, C, no, C, C, Su, C. I'm getting them mixed up now. All right. Um, Warblers are hard to see. So if you can learn their song, you'll know what's there. Because typically they're up in the trees, up in the leaves when they're coming out in the spring. Between their color and the shading and the shadows, it's hard to see them. This is what this guy sounds like. This gal, guy. Whoop. Go back and I... C, C, Su, Su, C. It, as far as its nest, it makes a little cup nest, but not quite as compact as like um, the other nests we saw. It doesn't have all the fibers in it. It uses just some um, like grasses and needles, pine needles and things like that that it puts together. In this case, this was really neat. Usually it's in the crotch of a tree. It found a little fold in a birch and found that and probably got a little shelter from it as well, a little uh, protection from the wind. But a great little bird. Um, and again, like I said, I, I see it way up high in the trees. But what's happening during that time frame is the violets are coming out. So, and we have is at least a half dozen different varieties of violets that we have in Maine. And, um, but these are more common, the, the yellow um, wood violet and the common purple violet, the white violets. You can find those in your lawn. Not so much the yellow ones as much. That likes wet areas more than it does dry areas, but um, it's pretty common. Yellow warbler. Yellow warblers um, are great. They like small trees. They like trees that have a lot of flowers and berries on them. They like to be near water. I think of them as being in like pen cherry, choke cherry. Um, yeah, maybe some of the poplars as well. But I, I see the most of them in things like pen cherry. So they build another nest. Um, this, is, this one is in... in red stem dogwood or osier dogwood. Again, it's a nice fibrous cup, tends to be deep. And they'll sit on top of that. But um, th again, they're using a lot of things like f fine feathers, downy feathers. They use um, milkweed, um, thistle down, and things to go on the outside as well as the inside of the nest. Male with stripes, female is clear-breasted. Pardon? They're common. Very common. Yep. Yeah. I know I had it. Well, for some reason it doesn't want to play. But anyway, what it does, it goes sweet, sweet, little more sweet. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. Um, oh. <laughs> took a while. Oh, okay. This is the recording I did, so I was waiting for it to call. Um, 
that's the, my <clears throat> rattling in my mic. So sweet, sweet, little more sweet. Oh, there was a bluebird in the background. All right, and like I, like I said, I think of it as cherry, and I think of service berry, June berry as well, amelanchias. Um, anybody know why this is the amelanchia or the, the service berry, June berry? That's the pen cherry up above. Do you know why it's called service berry or June berry? June berry because it typically grows around the first of June, starts blossoming. Service berry because when the snow was gone, the ground was thawed, you could actually start to bury your dead. So it was blooming about the same time, so they would actually collect it as a, a funeral um, flower. Yeah. So service berry. Northern Perula, that's another small warbler. Got that orange and, and uh, yellow, yellow throat. Has an orange top, and it's got a little yellow on the rump as well. Um, it's got a nice little song. We have those. We have those. They're going through in the spring. It's not the best song. A very raspy, choo -choo -choo, up, up going trill. Um, you can tell that they're m moving through here, not staying here and nesting, because look what they're building their nest out of. This is a nest. It's all made out of, yeah, um, it's called usnia moss, or lichen, usnia lichen. Like it's that long, some people call it um, old man's beard. Okay, it's drooping. And then um, they make it out of that, and they sit inside it. It's almost like they'll make sometimes bower type, but it's hanging. So great plant. Um, that's a great plant in another way is because it, when it's wet, it gets long and stretches out. When it's dry, it shrinks up again and, and, and get, it gets brittle. Um, when I think of those, I think of them in maple. So I thought of maple flower. This is sugar maple flower, which is, most people think of sugar maple as being red. It's not, it's, it's green, and it's got a greenish yellow flower. But it's got this very typical maple leaf um, with round rather than sharp points. Okay. But they love to get up in there, they love to find the, the these tr attract a lot of insects in the spring, so it's what the warblers love, to get in there and eat those insects. Not hatches. Um, I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes, so I'm going to go through the rest of this pretty quickly, because um, I want you to be able to see them all. Nut hatches. We have two types of nut hatches: white-breasted and red-breasted. The white-breasted sounds like this. Okay. He tends to go up and down the tree, head down. All right. Okay, it's going to keep going until I stop, but okay. Red-breasted, nasally. We'll get the difference. Hear, hear the nasally. Okay. White-breasted down, red-breasted goes up the tree. When I think of them, I think of them in furs and um, Tamarack, the two things that I thought of. These are the cones, the flowers for those two trees. Fir being the one with the candles goes up. T tamarack is just all over the stem. Black capped chickadee. It's the only chickadee we have. In the, well, we have two chickadees. The other one is a boreal chickadee, which comes down from the north, so it's not really a permanent resident here. We see it in the wintertime. So if people want to see boreal chickadees, they go up north in the state and they'll find them up there, up in the mountains and so forth. Chickadee, this is its spring song, which is already changing. Okay. 
That's not it. <laughs> but um, they're cavity nesters, um, as you can see up here. Um, up on the butt, up here, cavity nesters. And I associate it with white pine. Why do I show, associate black-capped chickadees and white pine? Maine. It's the state bird and the state flower. They're a chickadee or their own, yeah, genus, yeah. But you see, tend to see them with nuthatches, kinglets, as a communal birds. You know, and in, in the wintertime you see a lot of them together. And this, as the season comes on into spring, they start to separate out. Um, this one doesn't have a song. It, it has a few calls, but they weren't worth putting on here. But I wanted to talk about it because it's specific to a plant. Um, this is a northern shrike, and as far as plants, it likes hawthorn. It likes hawthorn for the thorns, not because it nests in it, and it doesn't eat the berries. It's a predator. It's a songbird that is predatory. It has a hooked beak on the end of a typical songbird beak. It will go after grasshoppers, it will go after small birds, it will go after young birds, it will go after mice. And in this case, you can see that it is a vole pierced on a thorn that is put in its hawthorn tree where it is making the hawthorn tree into a ladder. So it'll, that's what it does. It stores food there. It can, if it can't find any readily to eat fresh, it can go back to the hawthorn tree and eat some more. All right, these are cedar wax wings. All right, they have a very quiet song. Just a little buzzy song. Can you hear it? Yeah. Um, they're my favorite bird. One of my, well, winter wren is my favorite bird, but the cedar wax wings probably second. They just look like they're dressed to go to a, a ball or something. They're perfectly attired. Always look so neat. And what I think of with them is choke cherry. They're one of those birds that when the choke cherries are in bloom, bloom, you don't see them. When the berries are there, they're everywhere. Because um, they love those berries. And they'll, they'll sit there and feed them on it and on it until they get drunk. Um, pardon? They do. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Now, this I put up here because the next bird you're going to hear first loves areas like this. And this is West Kennebago Mountain in the background and Kennebago, the Logan and Kennebago Lake. Common loon. So here's your common loon. And um, the common loon is having a hard time. Uh, we do loon counts every year, or chick counts, and there was a little bit of an upswing on chick counts in, uh, in the last couple of years, but for a long time the chick count was diving. And the biggest issue with, with they like to be away from people, but people like the lakes that they go on and the ponds. They also like, people like to have deeper water because they like to use recreational boats. They don't like to run their boats aground. Well, the loons nest on mats close to the water. What's happened is we've raised the water levels in a lot of these ponds and lakes, shut off all of those nesting areas. The bird, or even in some places where the nests are already there, we close off a dam, we raise the water level for the summer, and we wash the nests away. So what people have started to do, which is helping, is they put floating platforms for the birds to nest on. The birds can't get away from the water because they can't walk. Their feet are so far back because they're diving birds and they use those feet to, to propel themselves through the water that they've got them on the rear end like a boat motor. So when they try to walk, they just fall flat. So they put their nest right near the edge of the water. They have a low nest and they just slide in and out of it. Um, 
when I think of plants, when I think of northern ponds and things, I think of the, the spatterdock, which is the yellow pond lily. Um, the other thing I, I think about that is moose. Moose love it. So the moose will come in, they'll clean all that spatterdock out, they'll go away for a few years, the spatterdock will come back, and then the moose will come back. <laughs> so, um, but great plants, great birds. Ruffed grouse. All right, rough grouse don't really have a song. All right, um, when they're mating, they're getting ready to mate. They, pardon? They sound like a motor. Yeah. Ah, somewhat. Yep. Yeah. This is what they sound like when they're they're trying to attract a mate, or claiming territory. Oops, <laughs> hit the wrong button. Where is it? Sounds like a train starting up. <laughs> okay? Now, how are they doing that? How are they somewhere in their chest? It's their wing. Oh, my God. Um, this bird right here, I was up in the Jackman area and walking along, taking pictures of moose, is what I was supposedly doing. And it came out. The log was there right next to the road. It jumped up on it and just started beating right there with me from here to the windows yeah I've heard it in a distance before never had seen it up so close and this you can see why they call it a ruffed grouse this is the rough and of course they display that tail when they're displaying as well just like a turkey does the female up above listening for the male beat And, of course, they have a plant named after them, because we typically call ruffed grouse in Maine partridge. And this is partridge berry. It had an older name, which is not politically correct anymore, and it used to be called squawberry. Um, not necessarily to be derogatory, but it was used by Native Americans during childbirth and um, reproductive rejuvenation after childbirth. It, it, um, was used medicinally by the Native Americans. All right. So, oof. barred owl. Barred owls are cavity nesters. Most owls um, nest in platforms, like uh, the great horned owl is a platform nester. Um, Sawit owls are nesting in cavities. The barred owls nest in cavities. Um, so it's the back and forth. Great birds, then they're hunters, they're predators, um, raptors. They have huge talons. Um, their beak is made for tearing meat, even though some food they just toss it up in the end and swallow it whole. <laughs> but if it's a big prey, they tear it apart. Their eyes are deep in sockets. They're the biggest eyes of any animal. They're, if, if we had the eyes comparable to a uh, owl, it would be the size of a grapefruit. Their ears are really unique because they're offset. One is up high, one is down low. One hears high frequency, the other hears low frequency. They use it for triangulation. They can actually listen, and that's why owls are turning their heads all the time. Two things they turn their head for. Birds cannot move their eyes. So they have to turn their head to see in different directions. Owls, we say they turn their head completely around. About 300, I mean 180 degrees they can turn it. They can't go all the way around, of course. <laughs> unless you buy one of those plastic ones. That <laughs> <laughs> all right. But um, so they're turning their head to listen. They can hit prey within two inches without being able to see anything, with total darkness. If there was a birthday candle at the other end of the room here, and would, otherwise it was totally black, they could see with their eyes. Their eyes are that adapted to the dark. But if they can't see, they can hunt dramatically well. Almost every hit, they, they get their prey from just hearing it. So um, great birds. And when I think of them, this is what I think of. Oop, 
Let's go back. We didn't hear it, did we? See? Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? So it does it both. Yeah. And the plan I think of is because they're breeding this time of year, and this is the time of year where you start to go out and look for them or listen for them calling because they're going to call mostly this time of year. Barred owls you can hear all year long. They'll call all summer long and raid it through the winter times. But right now they're calling far more than they ever do. And what's happening right now as well is there are flowers blooming out there in the woods. And that's witch hazel. And they're either starting to bloom for the spring bloom, because we have two species. One blooms in the fall, one blooms in the spring. The ones that bloomed in the fall, they put out seed pods. So that's uh, what's happening now. These are going to start to swell before long. And what they do is they swell up and they explode. And they can throw their seeds as many as 20 feet away. All right? So don't be around it when it's puffing. <laughs> but the flowers are beautiful. And of course, they're used uh, as an astringent. It's, a, it's a, a, an herbal um, remedy for skin rashes and things like that. Um, people wash their hair with it, whatever. But um, witch hazel. So that's it. So um, oh typically what I usually think of when I, when I talk to these things is I want to remind people, remember it's not the getting there that counts, but what you discover along the way. Enjoy the journey. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for having me, folks.